ministry team includes uh, some in the prison. So apparently some people are being a little bit slack in their responsibility. So pray that God would deepen the commitment there. It's hard to stay committed to a year-round ministry like that. It can really take it out of you, I know. Uh, more so for them than for us. <clears throat> okay. Next slide. Uh, okay, breaking news. Next week, the teens are going to be leading our worship again. We loved it so much when they did it, and we've, it was been requested that they do it again. So be sure that you're not late. Uh, and moms, uh, I've been told that you should please have your teens here by 9.07 a.m. <laughs> See, if you say 9 o'clock, it just kind of goes in one ear and out the other. 9.07, that's the time they need to be here. <clears throat> that's the latest. Well, that's the latest. <clears throat> okay, next. Um, this is just a little reminder that the parking lot out here, the rows that go across from one another, do not have a straight line down them. They go zigzaggy. Uh, make sure that you pull up to the very front of your marked parking spot. We tend to line up our car with the one over to our left as we're pulling in. But if you keep doing that, as you see, car D is dangerously uh, in, in danger of having its tail knocked off. So uh, <laughs> we don't want your car to get its tail uh, knocked off. What do you call Bumper, back bumper. That's what I'm trying to say. Okay, <clears throat> back bumper knocked off. <clears throat> So be sure you pull all the way up. Well, it's kind of like a tail. All right, the children's lesson <clears throat> this week. The children, the children are studying. Jesus forgives a sinful woman. And uh, Jesus was having dinner with the Pharisee when a sinful woman came in. She showed how much she loved Jesus by washing his feet with her tears, drying them with her hair, and pouring expensive perfume on his feet. Jesus was pleased by what she had done. So the uh, aim is so the children will know that Jesus will forgive their sins when they come to him in love, just as he did for the sinful woman. You know, we tend to think of the sinful woman as somebody outside our group. We're all sinful women, right? Every one of us is a sinful woman. <clears throat> so... Um, that really hit me this week when I was reminded of that story. The key word is forgiveness. So, um, oops. All right. I thought I had this out, but I don't. <clears throat> okay. It's a little booklet uh, uh, that they put together. Jesus forgives a sinful woman. And it... Uh, Tells the whole story about a woman who was sad over her sins came to Jesus uh, in love and Jesus forgave. Whoop, let me get this all together. <clears throat> Thank you, Vondine. Appreciate that help. Uh, I'm not sure what that craft is right there. <laughs> so, I'll, I'll explain what I think it is. Uh, sometimes uh, there's a suggested craft and they send pictures of it. And then uh, Dorothy, our craft lady, thinks of something real creative and substitutes it in place. So this is probably what uh, was <clears throat> the standard craft for that week. Either that or we've got the wrong week. I'm not sure. But anyhow, that's the way it is. <laughs> All right. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> On the right, so I turn my cough right toward the microphone. <coughs> okay, next slide. <coughs> Jesus once taught his disciples an important lesson, and afterward he said, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you. And that your joy may be complete. But you know, when he talked about our joy being complete, he did not mean we'd always be completely happy. As Christians, see, happiness comes from happenings, but joy comes from Jesus, no matter what is happening. <clears throat> Someone once observed that men have pursued joy in every avenue imaginable. Some have successfully found it, while others have not. Perhaps it would be easier to describe where joy cannot be found. <clears throat> joy cannot be found in unbelief. Voltaire, the famous Frenchman, was an infidel of the most pronounced type, and he wrote, I wish I had never been born. Not in pleasure, 
Lord Byron lived a life of wanton pleasure if anyone did, and he wrote, the worm, the canker, and grief alone are mine. <clears throat> Not in money. Jay Gould, an American multimillionaire, had plenty of that. When dying, he said, I suppose I am the most miserable man on earth. Not in position and fame, Benjamin Disraeli, uh, the Earl of Beaconsfield in England, had more than his share of both. He was a former prime minister of, uh, of England. And he wrote, youth is a mistake, manhood a struggle, old age a regret. And not in military glory. Alexander the Great conquered the known world in his day. We talked about him, didn't we, in the prophecy of him. Having done so, he wept in his tent and said, there are no more worlds to conquer. <clears throat> These men give evidence that joy can't be found in unbelief, pleasure, money, position, and fame, or military glory. There was nothing to rejoice over at the end, the dead-end street of their lives. Well, where then is real joy found? The answer is simple, in Christ alone. <clears throat> Remember, we sing that song, in Christ alone, my hope is found. Well, the answer is simple to say, yet to really experience joy in your relationship with Christ, even when you're suffering, you must do two things. Number one, you must know the riches that are yours as a believer. And number two, you must mix your faith with that knowledge. See, if you don't mix your faith with God's word, just, it's just words. <clears throat> Hebrews 4.2 explains that the generation that died in the wilderness heard the word of God, but it was of no value to them because they did not mix it with their faith. <clears throat> Next slide. Today's teaching, I've entitled Experiencing Joy in the Journey. <clears throat> Life is a journey, isn't it? Uh, its three parts are our position in Christ, verse 1 and 2, our possessions in Christ, 3 through 9, and our privileges in Christ, 10 through 12. <clears throat> and the central message is experiencing joy requires knowing and trusting in our riches in Christ. Kind of a long one, but worth it. Let's pray. Lord, you are so gracious and loving toward us. Um, we don't want to ever get angry at you when trials and hard times come, when suffering comes, because we know that you measure it in your hand for us and you will not give us more. Uh, you've promised you will not give us more than we can stand. And so we seek your wisdom, Lord, in whatever trials uh, have, come in our, uh, have come our way right now. If we are enduring them, if we're not, one's going to come along really soon. And so we want to be prepared, Lord, by knowing by knowing our position in Christ is secure, our, we have possessions in Christ, and we have privileges. And so we thank you for that this morning and pray that uh, uh, you would give us open ears and open hearts, uh, pliable hearts, teachable hearts, and I pray that my words might honor you and be your words. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> okay, open your Bibles to First Peter 1, even if it's, whoop, mine's gone black. Come on, come on. Ha, there it goes. <clears throat> Doesn't usually go black. It usually stays on the whole time. Anyway, um, knowing our position in Christ is the first step to joy. The very first step to joy. You must know your position in Christ. <clears throat> So uh, Peter salutes the Christians scattered throughout the provinces of the Roman, some of these provinces of the Roman Empire, and he salutes them as elect and chosen according to the foreknowledge of God. God's election is based solely on his love, not any worth of our own. God is sovereign, and he exercises his sovereign right to choose his own. As Paul tells us in Ephesians 1, 4, we were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. Paul tells the Colossian believers they are God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. Uh, love that dearly loved that came up just like Daniel, right? <coughs> Oops. <coughs> Excuse me, I have a dry throat today. Isn't it an encouragement to know that you are God's because he chose you? 
You know, when doubts kind of nag at the perimeter of your faith, is this, this whole salvation thing, is that something I just believed because I wanted to or someone pressured me? Did I really make a decision Christ for Christ? I mean, I wanted to, but did I say the right prayer? Did I understand everything when I asked him to be my Savior? Was it enough? Was it right? And then God says, of course it was enough. <laughs> it's not about you. It's about me. I chose you and you are mine forever. Once I place my trust in Jesus, I am said to be, quote, in Christ. We see that phrase, in Christ, oh, thank you so much, <clears throat> all throughout the New Testament. And it always refers to the believer's secure position. It always refers to something God did, not what you did. <clears throat> You're in that position because God has placed you there, and he will never, never let you go. Knowing my eternal destination doesn't rest in my fragile grip is a source of great assurance and joy for me, isn't it to you? Isn't it neat that all three members of the Trinity have a part in our salvation? One friend, one, one friend once put it this way, uh, the Father seeks us, the Son saves us, and the Holy Spirit sanctifies us. <clears throat> Peter explains that those who are chosen by God the Father are sanctified by the Spirit for obedience to Christ Jesus and for sprinkling with his blood. You know, Moses sprinkled the children of Israel with the blood of the sacrifice, and he did it one time, one time when God gave the, com the, the commandments. <clears throat> and uh, he sprinkled the blood to the crowd around him, and that, was, uh, that sealed the covenant. <clears throat> Uh, they promised to obey. That was what sealed the covenant, the blood. On the basis of Jesus Christ's blood in his once for all one time sacrifice, the Holy Spirit sanctifies us and sanctifies means to, to set us apart for God's use and to make us clean. So the Holy Spirit sanctifies us so that we are acceptable to God. Uh, <clears throat> and that sanctification process keeps on going as we walk our journey with Christ. Only the blood of Jesus cleanses anything. <laughs> Hebrews tells us that the blood of bulls and goats could never atone for sin, else the priests wouldn't have had to kill those bulls and goats over and over and over and over. Killing these animals was simply a teaching visual to teach Israel that blood must be shed to pay for their sins. That truth was intended to prepare them to recognize Jesus as their Messiah when he came. But as we know, very few of them did. <clears throat> I think, you know, we could talk about election a long time. Um, we don't argue about things like that in CBS. But I, I think it's impossible for our finite minds to understand that concept of election. God choosing us. It's just overwhelming. And, and after all, we know from many other scriptures that we also must choose Christ. The gospel message is, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Acts 16.31. Jesus declares in John 3.36 that whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. There's definitely a choice there. That's clear. The Bible declares both election, and man's responsibility to choose in some wonderful, supernatural, holy way orchestrated by God, there is a mutual choosing and we become in Christ. In John 10, 9, Jesus says, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. And an illustration that has given me peace of mind about uh, the whole election thing involves a gate. <coughs> tells of a traveler, hungry, thirsty, and tired, who came upon a large, beautiful gate. Next slide. <clears throat> slide. Okay. <laughs> You'll see in a minute a picture of a gate. Um, <clears throat> on the other side was a beautiful landscaped garden and a winding path that led to a mansion. On the gate was a sign, whoever will. I should be very foolish not to accept this gracious offer, he said to himself. And so, finding no lock on the gate, he opened it and passed through. 
inside the garden was even more beautiful than he had seen from the outside. As he made his way up the path toward the mansion ahead, he could hardly believe uh, the benefits of his excellent choice, but he thought he would turn back and look one last time at the sign. Next slide. And when he did, he was amazed to see, slide, (laughs) that the back of the sign read, chosen in him before the foundation of the world. So it's a two-way thing. The concept of election is so very difficult for us to comprehend, but other Bible truths are crystal clear. My dear friend, if you are seeking God today, know that you must come through that gate, and that only gate is Jesus Christ himself. You must make that choice in order to have any relationship with God. Do not let the inability to understand these deep things of God keep you from the simple and clear command that Jesus has for every human. You must be born again. One who's been born again is simply one who's put her trust in Christ as the atonement for her sin. This salvation can't be earned It's the free gift of God. Dear friend, do you know for sure that you have been spiritually born again, that the Holy Spirit has done that for you? Believer, have you learned to rest in the security that God has given you, knowing that one who's been born can never be unborn? If you're a mother, can you imagine the difficulty of unborning one of your children? (laughs) Once a son, always a son. That's the way it is with God the Father. Experiencing this security, that's the first step of the riches that God has given to you and me. Experiencing joy comes from... I know it's awful, isn't it, to even think about. Experiencing joy comes from first knowing our riches in Christ and knowing we're eternally secure in Him brings great joy. I'm going to take a break here. Okay, our possessions in Christ. The moment we're saved, we are said to be in Christ. That's our position. So through our position in Christ, we have many possessions that are ours to be useful tools for our journey here on earth. Peter points some of these out in verses 3 through 9. Next slide. We have a living hope. Not a hope so, but looking forward with to uh, looking forward to something with certainty. Remember how discouraged the disciple, disciples were on the Emmaus road? We had hoped that Jesus was the one who was going to redeem Israel, they moaned. But how they lit up and were re-energized when they realized that this was Jesus walking with him and he was alive. He was resurrected. They turned around and walked the eight miles back to Jerusalem in the dark. Jesus was alive, and that made all the difference. Jesus is our living hope. We're born again to a living hope through his resurrection. And uh, the fact that Jesus is alive, that's the one thing, or that's one of the things, that distinguishes our Savior from Muhammad, Buddha, and Confucius. They're all dead. (laughs) He is alive. Because Jesus is alive, he can impart his life to his own today. Some people have a really vague idea of hope, you know, hope things are going to turn out well. Some people only, you know, put their hope in a person. Well, my parents will bail, bail me out of this or, or my husband will take care of this. But Jesus is the only living hope that will always be living. Think about that. Furthermore, he's given us his living word. So a living Savior and a living word. The Bible, the word of God is alive and powerful, it says in Hebrews. It has the, its truths are just as true and relevant as they were the day they were written. Second, after a living hope, we have an incorruptible inheritance. Our inheritance will never grow old or decay. Think about an inheritance as something that we haven't earned. We receive it through the death of a loved one. Receiving the inheritance meant someone has to die. And in our case, it's Jesus that died to give us that inheritance. Have you seen the bumper sticker on the back of a motorhome that says, we're spending our children's inheritance? (laughs) Well, we have an inheritance that can't be spent. It's guaranteed. It's secure. Not like money in the stock market. It is on reserve in the bank of heaven, and the benefits it earns are truly out of this world. You might even say heavenly. It's an inheritance that is guaranteed because it is 
it says verse 4 kept in heaven for you and literally that means kept watch over by God kept in heaven for you you who by God's power are being guarded through faith so in verse 4 our inheritance is being kept for us in verse 5 we're being kept for our inheritance which brings us to blessing number three. We have a divine protection. God assures his people they will not be lost. They will be with him in heaven. <clears throat> number four, developing faith. The trials test and develop our faith. You would not have the confidence to stand for Christ in a big thing if you had never stood for him in a small thing. Peter compares our faith to God. And when we compare things, we say what is alike about them. He compares our faith to gold, which must be heated white hot to remove the impurities in a very hot fire. When the metal smith sees the reflection, his reflection in the molten gold, then he knows that the gold is pure. In a similar way, our faith must be tested in the fire until we reflect Christ in that day when Christ is revealed. Now, he's revealed a little bit to us as we know more about him, but this, the day Christ is revealed means when he returns. Now, if we, contra we compare, we say what's alike between two things. If we contrast, we say what's different. So then Peter contrasts our faith with gold saying that our faith is worth much more than gold. In the economy of heaven, gold cannot buy one sinner from the slave market of sin, and gold will perish one day. But we, as God's children, will never perish. We're promised, and our purified faith will bring glory to Jesus Christ on that day when he returns. Okay, number five, we have an unseen Savior. We don't see him with our eyes, but we trust him, and he's worthy of that trust. Peter seems to be marveling over the fact that people who had never seen Jesus loved him. Uh, knowing Jesus brings joy that it's so, uh, of such depth that it's, uh, you can't put it into words. It's inexpressible. There are just no words to express it. Joy is knowing Jesus and counting on all the riches that we have in him. Number six, a guaranteed deliverance. Uh, we're delivered from sin in this world and ultimately uh, a deliverance from this uh, world to heaven. Now, when you and I talk about salvation today, we tend to point to, to one decision in a moment of time, like I was saved when I was in college. Uh, <clears throat> but Peter pictures salvation as a process that is past and pe present and future. This is going to be very important the way Peter talks about salvation as a process. Salvation in the past was God's design of a plan to rescue sinful man. Salvation in the present is the way your salvation is working out, the way it's manifesting itself, the way it's showing. Salvation in the future is when your life is complete and you are presented to Christ. Next slide. We are being kept unto salvation. We have been saved from the penalty of our sin. We are being saved from the power of our sin. That's verse 9. And we shall be saved from the presence of our sin, finally, in verse 4. Uh, so because our salvation will be revealed in the last time. Uh, you might think of the word deliverance might be more clear to us. When Peter talks about salvation, he's talking about deliverance, <clears throat> which is the way the Jewish people talked about salvation in, in the Old Testament. Okay, uh, we shall be saved from the presence of our sin, and it will be revealed at last. It will be revealed when we close our eyes in death and open them in heaven. It will be revealed when Jesus Christ comes back to receive us to himself, and it will be finally and fully revealed at the judgment when it's shown forth to all of creation that our salvation, our deliverance was not based on any merit we might have thought we had or any works that we've done, but it's based solely and completely on the finished work of Jesus Christ to the praise and glory of his name and to the praise and glory of the Father. Just knowing that my salvation will be accomplished in spite of my weaknesses and failures, which I have many, and that one day, my salvation will bring glory to Jesus' name. That brings joy to my heart, doesn't it, to yours, if I stop and think about that. Joy is knowing and living by those riches that we have in Christ. 
Uh, now, Peter's called attention to several spiritual blessings that all Christians are blessed with, and this reminds us of that beautiful passage in Paul's letter to the Ephesian Christians. In Ephesians 1, Ephesians 1 3 and 4, Paul says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That sounded kind of like our memory verse, didn't it? But this is Paul. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. Next slide. Paul is giving us a picture of, of what we are in the heavenly realms from God's timeless perspective. And that was the best I could do for a picture. Our salvation is already accomplished and we are already seated in heaven with Christ positionally. We are blessed with every spiritual blessing. Peter, on the other hand, next slide, shows the whole past, present, and future facets of salvation. But he pictures us as tr still trudging up the road, which may bring dangers and hardships and pitfalls, trials, grief, but he offers encouragement through our testing. Uh, you know, a certified public accountant did something that maybe all of us should do. He decided to uh, open a debit and credit book with God. He wanted to write down everything that God gave him and everything that he gave to God. If someone did him a favor, he put that down as God's gift to him. <clears throat> he also credited God with the sun, his food, his health, uh, his friends and his family, and a thousand other benefits he received. On the other hand, he put down what he did for God. Time spent in prayer, money he gave to the church and charities, all the good deeds he could think of. Finally, he gave up saying, it is impossible for me to balance these books. I find that God is indeed my creditor and what I have done for him is next to nothing. Are you living in the knowledge of all these blessings God has given you? Are you mixing your faith with each possession that God has promised you so you can really know the blessing, not just know about it, so you can count on it and apply it when you have those hard things? Knowing God's already given these things to you is important, but using your faith to mix with them, to apply them to your life, that's what will bring you joy and it will push you towards spiritual maturity. <clears throat> Okay, we have privileges in Christ, verses 10 through 12. Think about the great prophets like Daniel and Isaiah and Jeremiah. Think about their tremendous dedication and their great relationship with God the Father. Now think about this. Because we have the Bible as the completed word of God, you can know more about Christ the Savior and God's plan than any of them did. You can understand far more about God's plan for salvation than they did. In Colossians 1.26, Paul writes about, quote, the mystery hidden for ages and generations but now reveals, revealed to his saints. That's us. We have the full account of God's revelation. Is it any wonder that these old prophets searched and inquired carefully, as Peter says, scratching their heads trying to figure out the mystery of how the Messiah could be a victorious deliverer and king and yet one who suffered and died? How did those go together? They couldn't understand. Surely they searched the law, the history scrolls, David's psalms, even their own writings to see, well, did I put down something that I hadn't really thought about? Each prophet didn't even understand all of what he himself had written under the direction of the Holy Spirit. And Peter says, <clears throat> Peter says, the Spirit of Christ in them. They didn't understand when it would happen or how, but Peter says it was revealed to them when they asked that they were not serving themselves, serving those to come after them down through the ages, specifically believers like those to whom Peter first wrote and specifically to us and everybody, all Christians in between. Not only did those old prophets not understand, but even angels longed to know how salvation will work out, <clears throat> how God will work out his glorious plan of salvation. Each of the prophets saw different facets of God, of Christ, of the Savior, of salvation. But now, through the completed Bible, we can put all these facets together and see his full glory. What a privilege we believers have today. Shouldn't we take great joy in studying God's word to know more about God's riches to us and experience him more deeply? Okay, suppose you're going on an automobile trip to New York City. You have a reliable car and money for gas, but not a lot extra to spend. <clears throat> 
Now suppose a good friend decides to surprise you and makes you a goodie box. In it are a travel guide, a new smartphone to guide you with its GPS, and yours is all out of date in your car. <clears throat> Gift cards to various nice res uh, restaurants that you might encounter. A warm winter coat for the cold that some swanky sunglasses for when you drive facing, facing the sun, and, and tickets to some Broadway shows. She wraps the box and carefully places it in the trunk, thinking with delight how you're going to enjoy these gifts. You arrive at your destination in New York, but during your whole trip, you never looked in the trunk. Since you never knew the gifts were there, they were of no value, were they? You had a rougher trip, you had a, ate a lot of McDonald's hamburgers, and you missed out on a whole bunch of rewards at the end. You know, it's the same with God's Word. You can be saved and reach your destination of heaven, but if you never know those blessings of yours found in His Word, look what you'll miss. Do you know your position, your possessions, and your privileges you have in Christ as God's Word reveals? Are you using them? on your journey. <clears throat> okay, final illustration. I have to tell you that I love this book. I picked it up in Galveston on the Strand one time. It's called Famous Last Words, Fond Farewells, Deathbed Diatribes, and Exclamations Upon Expiration. <clears throat> <laughs> Some of them are very sad. Some of them are funny. <clears throat> Some of them are like, what are they talking about? <clears throat> but anyway, um, where then is real joy found? The answer is simple, in Christ alone. So having begun with the deathbed statements of some famous men who died uttering perplexing, perplexing statements of doubt, despair, and doom, I thought it would be good to contrast the statements of some others who proclaimed their serenity of soul with hope in Christ. George Washington first president of the United States. On his deathbed, he composed his limbs, closed his eyes, folding his arms on his chest, and he died saying, Father of mercies, take me to thyself. C.H. Spurgeon, the old preacher, nearing the end of life, he said, Tranquil and happy, though very weak, my theology is very simple. I can express it in few words, and they are enough to die by. After a pause, he slowly said, Jesus died for me. Charles Dickens, British author, I commit my soul to the mercy of God through our Lord Jesus Christ, and I exhort my dear children to humbly try to guide themselves by the teaching of the New Testament. Michael Faraday, he was a chemist, a scientist, when on his deathbed he was asked, what are your speculations now? Speculations, exclaimed Faraday, I have none. No speculations now. I know whom I have believed. My soul rests on certainties. <clears throat> and finally, Patrick Henry, uh, the American founding father, wrote shortly before his death, I have now disposed of all my property to my family. There is one thing more I wish I could give them, and that is faith in Jesus Christ. If they had that, and I had not given them a single shilling, they would have been rich. And if they had not that, and I had given them all the world, they would be poor indeed. Have you discovered the deep riches of knowing Christ and the joy that that brings? Experiencing joy requires knowing our riches in Christ and then mixing, with them, mixing them with our faith and trusting uh, those to live by. You choose to know God's truth and mix your faith with them so that you could have real joy that Peter writes about. Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, you love us so much. You're so gracious to us. Uh, we want to say that we love you. Lord, um, we praise your name. Uh, whether we are going through great times of great joy right now in the happenings or whether we're going through some deep sufferings, um, we know that you're in control, that you are sovereign, and we know that your love is always there and you're always there for us. I pray, Lord, that each of us might know that joy that Peter wrote about in this passage today. And I ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>